Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Campbell. I am the editor-in-chief of the research publishing company, Springer Nature. It's a great pleasure to be here um, to talk about a really important topic, which is, in the title, it says, Bridging Science with Society. Um, I'm going to generalize it slightly and say bridging research with society. Uh, because in English, we have the limitation that the word science specifically means the natural sciences and doesn't necessarily include other equally important branches of knowledge, such as the social sciences, the humanities, engineering, and so on. So those are all there for discussion, <coughs> but the focus, the primary focus of this is indeed the, the natural sciences and the clinical sciences and so on. So it's a great pleasure to introduce a very distinguished panel and I will just tell you who they all are. And um, I hope I'm going to go along the line here. So to my immediate left, we have the State Secretary for Education and Research and Innovation for Switzerland, Martina Hirayama. Next to her, we have the Minister of State for Advanced Sciences of the United Arab Emirates, Sarah Bint Yusuf Al-Amiri. Next to her, we have Andrew Thompson, co-founder and chief executive officer of Proteus Digital Health from the United States. Then we have Shalisa Sayuras, who is a medical researcher in cardiovascular diseases from the Academic Hospital of Paramaribo in Suriname. And then last but not least, we have Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who's the president of the European Research Council. So these are people who have very interesting things to say, I can tell you, about these things. But what's also important about this discussion is that it is open. So there are people here with microphones. I will open it up to the floor at particular points, and they will decide who to give the microphone to, and then you will have your chance to make comments or ask questions. The one thing I would say is please keep it short. Please do not turn it into a speech. Um, I've asked these people to keep it short too, just so you know. So we're going to begin with some opening statements by each, and I think we'll go along actually in the order in which we have here. So State Secretary, first, please. Thank you, ve thank you very much. Also, welcome from my side. I'm happy to be here today. I believe that it's very important to tackle the challenges we have today and in the future to have an exchange between science and uh, society. We need research to answer important questions and we need the society because th there are a lot of questions and challenges which only can be tackled if we have a change in behavior. Take for example climate change. Everybody here in this room, we, we have to change our behavior to be part of the solution um, of climate change. Science has to cooperate and exchange, uh, be in dialogue with society. Science must understand the importance, the need of this exchange, and uh, science has to take into consideration the audience, because it's different if you communicate with a scientific audience or with a general public, and it's important to explain the questions, the scientific questions, the scientific answers in an understandable way. We also should think about incentives, because nowadays in science it's very important to have uh, scientific publications, to make a career at university and uh, in general in research. And we should think if we could, uh, yes, find interesting incentives also to increase the interest of researchers to be in communication with uh, the public. And uh, yes, I'm interested to hear today what you think about this topic and what ideas you have to improve uh, the interaction and the communication between science and society. Thank you very much. Um, I will just ask you one little question. You emphasize there the need to encourage scientists to do the dialogue. Mm -hmm. 
Um, can you say a little bit more about what in Switzerland is happening to encourage that? We have uh, different ways to do this in Switzerland. We have, for example, uh, the scientific academies, and one of their main goals is to improve the exchange between science and uh, society. Um, we have uh, foundations, uh, Sciences Cité, for example, who um, have um, the goal to improve uh, the communication. We have uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation, um, which funds uh, special formats uh, for exchange. Uh, and so we have quite, quite a lot of things going on already. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we already... Um, yes, have exchanged, but probably the public is not broad enough. Okay. So right now we meet uh, the society which is really interested in science, but I think we also have to get into action with a broader public, and we have to think about formats, how, how we can do this. Okay, thank you very much. Minister, please. So good morning, everybody, first off. Um, just having this topic at this forum and discussed several times in different formats throughout the entire week brings to the attention of why are we discussing the role of science and science and technology and society. The reason for that, now more than ever and in the future more than ever, every person, we're not only talking about people that are particularly scientists, engineers, um, that are in the field or researchers, everybody in their daily lives is exposed in one way or another to the byproducts of science, to technologies, and they're becoming more and more part of our lives that we need to better understand, one, where it came from, make informed decisions um, around it. So coming from that perspective, at least personally, um, a primary focus is actually education and a better understanding from an education perspective of why do we, and this is something that I myself went through in, in school, why are we studying this in physics? Why are we taking this subject in chemistry? How is this formula relevant? And this is coming from somebody that actually continued on to the sciences. And for us, it was very interesting dialogue when we took scientists to schools and they were able to explain to them, for example, when you study the different radio waves and the electromagnetic spectrum, because you studied this, that's how we're able to understand and study other planets using remote sensing as an example. Um, and it gives them a better understanding of Okay, so this is something small that I'm taking today that actually has a significant impact um, into what we're doing. And another analogy that we see scientists using a lot is, for example, the phones that are in their hands and pointing out how much science background and how much research over centuries has gone to get to the phone that you have in your device. Um, everything that is the product, any technology that you have has ha had at least thousands of people over at least an entire century who have contributed to that body of science. So if you're talking about a phone, for example, the electronics had a lot of investment in basic science for us to get to a, a level where we're able to have that at a small scale um, in, our, in our hands. Um, same thing with the cameras that are there. Same thing with a lot of things that we are exposed to on a daily basis. And it's a better dialogue on understanding the things that we see as fragmented, how they all come together into something that touches our lives on a daily basis. So in your country, I know you've made a very strong program to get scientists into schools <laughs> and into public places, but the schools especially. Yeah. So maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about actually how you've done that, but also I'm interested to know whether what they have picked up from being in those schools that has influenced their thinking. So through, the national, uh, through our National Academy of Scientists, there's actually an entire science outreach um, committee that is convened there in science communication. And something that I want to state, it is actually something that the scientists said that they need to do more of. And through that, we launched a scientist in residence program uh, that takes scientists across various schools, across various cities in the UAE, but more importantly, even to rural cities where usually they don't get a lot of exposure from the outside world. We've gotten very strong impact on the students, but you've mentioned something very important on what do the scientists get out of this. Um, one, they get a better appreciation and understanding of the community of students that are there. Um, they are able to, to shift the way that they talk to, to students. So it takes them a while, so we, we usually give them about two weeks notice and we get a lot of back and forth between them on how to change. So scientists are used to to speaking in forums, 
with their peers. Um, and they're not used to speaking in forums with, um, with students, especially students in schools. And what we're working together with them is to tr transform the way that we talk, and this is something that even I usually don't refrain to, to transforming it into storytelling. So they usually tell the story of science, not through the scientific findings, but rather through their personal story on getting to the scientific findings. And that we've seen has resonated a lot with the students. Mm -hmm. And especially students usually, so they usually hold, so communities usually hold scientists in high regard and sometimes think of them people that do no mistakes. So just knowing the challenges that they faced, um, that they've done a lot of mistakes and failed a lot of times to get to a particular scientific finding, shifted the perception of uh, in students on whether or not they can be scientists. Yes, right, thank you. Andrew. Okay, so um, th the question that was posed here is how can, how can we bridge the gap between science <coughs> and society? And as a general point here, I think we live in an era where we have a technology excess and a trust deficit. And <coughs> I think it's really important to look at why we have that trust deficit. And I'm gonna talk about three things. Sensationalism, absolutism, and elitism, which I think are three things that uh, have really been damaging. So the first thing is sensationalism. So since the 1970s, people have been making, in my view, very excessive claims about all kinds of things like um, food supply and famine, uh, resource exhaustion, uh, global warming, global cooling, too much nitrogen, too much CO2. And all of these things may be very legitimate concerns, but the problem is if you make very big claims and they consistently don't come true, then you start to have people scratch their heads. And so being sensational about issues is very damaging, I think. Um, let's go to absolutism. Uh, science is not always exact, and it can always involve, uh, in complex systems, trading out risks, particularly collective risks versus individual risks. And so it's really important that those things are explained. And inside that, it's really important that we welcome people who have views that actually don't necessarily agree with everybody else's because a core part of science is skepticism. And it's really important to welcome people who are trying to disprove things that other people might believe is true. After all, if not, not so long ago, people thought the Earth was flat. And so we now know it isn't, and that was a scientific uh, discovery. And the last thing, then, is elitism. So rich and powerful people often come together in all kinds of beautiful places like Davos, and they talk about things, and then they come up with ideas and policies that are going to save the planet, maybe. But they can also do other things, like make farmers poor and car workers unemployed, and you can keep going on. And so. When that happens, it's really, really important that the risks that are incurred through the use of coercive government power are clearly thought through with and balanced with the potential benefits that would come from using that kind of power. And that must be done with full consideration for the people who are not in the room, which is society. Could you say a little bit about what you've just said, any aspect of what you've just said in the context of where you work, which is in the health sphere? Where have you seen things of the sort you've talked about that have been something that's damaging or something where you have been able to respond positively, in fact? So I'll be very specific. The company that I uh, have helped to create um, makes medicines that when you swallow them, communicate with your mobile phone and put on your mobile phone information about what you've swallowed and how your body responds. That's actually very important because most of what we spend in healthcare today is on managing chronic conditions, and those conditions are mainly managed by drugs. And in fact, what happens is that most people who have been prescribed a drug don't take it. And that's true in every country in the world, in every demographic, for every condition. And so being able to know and understand how a consumer is using their medicines and then creating a social network with family members or a professional network with a care team around that person can have extraordinary therapeutic benefits. They're really, really massive, and we've studied these in over 120 different clinical studies. The FDA approved these products in 2017, and the media response, from my perspective, was completely unhinged and simply went to but this is terrible. What about privacy? What about stealing this information? What about abusing this information? And none of that was tied to any form of reality. It was just a sensational headline that a very well-known newspaper in the United States decided to print that led to, for example, 
legislators in California deciding that they had to enact in emergency legislation to stop this because after all it was dangerous. And so sensational, absolute, and then the elites get involved and try and stop it. And oh, by the way, when they're doing that, they explicitly exempt themselves from their own rules. Okay. It's just terrible. All right, lots of stuff we could talk about there. Yeah. Shalisa, over to you. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I will talk about um, uh, this topic um, from my point of view as a medical researcher and a public health researcher. Um, and I actually want to go back to the start of um, you know, conducting a study. I think it's really important to also, when you're um, conducting a, a research in uh, a certain area, to also involve that population. Um, so get on with an external advisory board, uh, including community leaders, so you can have a more validated um, research concept and your methods. And also periodic uh, meetings with um, your external board can also help with communicating um, the progress of your study and also the results. In addition, we as scientists um, also have the uh, obligation to communicate um, as the other panelists already said, um, to the community in layman language and to nuance the, the sensational news that's you know, coming up in the, new, in, in the media, especially now with social media that's been having a huge influence on uh, society's perception on science. Um, so yeah, we as uh, scientists have to uh, be involved in every step of the whole scientific process from coming up with a research uh, question until conducting it and also the dissemination or the communication of your results and the implement, uh, implications of your results um, for that population. So, yeah. So I remember in the early days of nanotechnology in Britain, there were some public engagement exercises which were very far upstream in the research process. Uh, so they were more abstract uh, than what you have described. And yet the scientists and the publics did learn from each other about some of the fears and the scientists gained from understanding that and the public, I think, had some of their fears alleviated and mm -hmm. so on. But you're talking about something that is more particular to the project. Right, yes. And I'm interested to get a sense from you of how your f thinking as a researcher mm -hmm. was influenced by that involvement. Yes. Um, so it actually started, I'm a classically trained biomedical scientist, and so I was in the lab during my first years in, co in uh, university. And then I had a discussion with uh, a community leader uh, talking about how will we implement the, the results of our studies in communities when we're not even discussing what the results are, the truth about the results that, we, that, we, that we're finding, and how do we take in societal behavior or the societal factors. Because for instance, if we're talking about um, finding out, uh, uh, discovering a new drugs, um, do we take into account that that drug needs to be transported to different countries, having different climates, having different cultures, different beliefs? How will we be able to um, yeah, make, uh, have the drug have the effect that we as scientists want it to have? And so that really shaped it for me to not only be um, you know, a, a lab scientist, but also uh, look at it uh, from a perspective of the, of the society, of public, and that's why I then switched a little bit to public health uh, as a minor. Um, and we are currently in Suriname in the process of doing a, big su a, bi a large study on the effects of mercury pollution mm -hmm. on um, uh, pregnant women and their offspring. And so um, I am in the data management team of that. And one, one of the good things of that study is that we really have a comprehensive external advisory board with uh, community leaders, because in Suriname you have the interior with different tribes, uh, you know, the tribal communities, and um, if we need the involvement and the inclusion of all, uh, of all Surinamese women um, that are pregnant, we also need to go back to their communities and talk with their community leaders, but also uh, it, uh, the external advisory board also includes doctors, mm -hmm. so they're physicians, and so it is really important in public health research to include all factor, all stakeholders, if you want to have a, a validated study and a valid for that specific uh, population that you're studying okay. with. Thank you. Yeah. Jean-Pierre. 
Well, thank you for <coughs> the opportunity to discuss this uh, very important issue. For me, I, I would like to go back to what science is and how it is, uh, how the public is exposed to it. And the first moment, uh, actually, basically everybody is exposed to science is, of course, in schools. And for the moment, and in many countries, I think uh, the tendency has been very much to present uh, science as some kind of a a frozen body of knowledge and for which people sometimes have a difficult re I mean uh, I mean relation to in particular I'm a mathematician so in particular for for mathematics because they see this also as something which may actually even obstruct what they would like to do in life because they see this also as a selection mechanism in which they may be taken out of this when they should not and so I think for me uh, the validity and the the strengths of, si of science and the the it's and the basis of its validity is, of course, the fact that it is uh, based on a scientific method. And uh, so for me, it's extremely important, uh, although I'm fully aware at some point you have to teach science as a body of knowledge. But first of all, you have to make it very clear that this body of knowledge is evolving, including mathematics, uh, new topics, new concepts, new problems, new challenges. Uh, but at the same time, the people have to be really confronted personally with the scientific method. How do you validate some, uh, some results? Uh, why is doubt that it was mentioned is really the basis? Skepticism is fundamental in science, but it doesn't mean that uh, doubt uh, creates uh, uh, impossibility of using things. Uh, there is definitely in science the notion of uh, uh, probability as a value. But of course, people feel very uncomfortable with uh, the concept of probability because they they always fear they would be in the wrong side. And but still, if at the societal dimension, uh, social dimension, then of course this um, can actually make a big difference. If you uh, if you refuse to get into this, uh, so there are risks, but you can measure the risk, and then you can really uh, from that go on and come up with uh, some, uh, some method to implement results of science. So for me, it's extremely important to, to get this relation between science and the people already at the school level, which means, of course, the key people for this will be the teachers. So the teachers have to be uh, educated in a way where, of course, they have to transmit knowledge, but at the same time, transmitting the uh, understanding how knowledge is built is probably as important as knowledge itself. And for the moment, I, at least for my own country, France, this dimension is basically totally absent of the training of teachers. And I think uh, you, if you want them to be ambassadors of knowledge, you have to also make them uh, really, uh, to empower them to do that, which means they have a personal reflection and also maybe put in place the right tools. And of course, direct relations of scientists with the people in schools, I mean, kids or yeah. students, uh, but also teachers is absolutely fundamental. So you're a math mathematician. France has a glorious mathematical tradition. You are also a teacher in university. Um, can you give us an example, if you have ever encountered one, of someone who has been able to really convey statistics and probabilities to the public so that they begin to get an understanding? And, and they may not be comfortable with it, but nevertheless, somehow or another, that can be conveyed to the public, not to the mathematic, not to the mathematician. Sure. No, actually, um, this can be done in many different ways. I mean, of course, the, you, it was said uh, how much uh, sentientism is, is bad for science, but at the same time, uh, there is a, a community which also is very much subject to, uh, to sentientism, which is art. And I personally was involved in several exhibits on science, and in actually in the most unexpected places. The example I, I tend to give is this uh, um, gallery in Paris, which is uh, uh, the, um, the, the well, the gallery of the uh, Cartier Foundation for um, Contemporary Art, where we had uh, an exhibit on uh, mathematics, which actually was not an exhibit on mathematics. It was an exhibit between relations between artists and scientists, mathematicians. And what was really fantastic was the way these two creators were fascinating, fascinating each other. And uh, 80,000 people came to see this exhibit. And it, it goes on, it, uh, I, I just got a message today from the director of the foundation saying that he had been again exposed to people who found this uh, exhibit, a total change in their um, approach to mathematics. And particularly one dimension was exactly what you said about statistics and uh, probability. Yeah. Uh, because all of a sudden, oh, but, and then the, the way, the reason why they got caught was that because an artist managed to catch 
a totally unexpected way of uh, looking into it. So putting together these two worlds of creation actually created something different for which people posi position themselves differently to. Okay. Now what I'd like to do is I'm going to come on to a topic which I think everyone on the panel has something to say about, which reflects some of the challenges in science communication and understanding, but also the, the public's interests, and that's vaccination. But before we come on to that, I wanted to just find out who is in the audience. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask three questions and just put up your hands. If you are a researcher, please put up your hand. Okay, good to know. Thank you. If you are a school student, put up your hands. Great. If you have never met a professional scientist, put up your hand. Okay, we're reasonably in connection with science. <laughs> so that's good. Thank you. Okay, so I, I wanted to come on to vaccination because it's a topic that is emerging as yet again as a key, I see it as a threat. Uh, the resistance to vaccination um, is a threat to public health. There is a tension on the one hand between the risks as perceived by parents. Um, there is definitely some misinformation out there. There is lobbying going on. But at the same time, you could say there is a failure by scientists to communicate things. Some of the concepts involved are quite complex. So the idea that um, a significant proportion of the population needs to be vaccinated if that population is going to be protected, the concept of herd immunity. So th this is not necessarily a straightforward debate where if, uh, if only you could understand the science, all would be well. So it is quite complicated. So I'm going to dive in with the panel and I'm going to do exactly the same as I just did and invite you each to say something about what you, you see as the problem or somewhere where you've seen hope from a solution. I don't mind how you tackle it. And then I will throw it open to the audience for anyone to make a comment. So State, sec State okay. Secretary. Science is important. Science can answer important questions, but science does not have solution for everything and science cannot avoid any risk. And vaccination is a good example, of course. Vaccination is a great chance for society to improve health, but it still has risks at the end. And I think it's very important to uh, communicate the risks in a transparent way that uh, each single person and society in general um, knows and understands the risks and can, um, yes, um, compare the risk for the society in, in total mm -hmm. and, for, for and the risk for the single person. And of course, with vaccination, you have risks if you do vaccination, but you also have risks if you don't. And you have to uh, to look at the two um, yeah. at the two <laughs> possibilities you have, and then I think it's also important to have a discussion in society what this means for the whole society. If at a certain point uh, we have a amount of persons who do not use vaccination and therefore give a higher risk to the complete yeah. society. Right. But I think we have to have a discussion about it and it has to be open because uh, we cannot uh, deny that uh, there are still risks at the end, whatever we do. Thank you very much. Minister. So I'll continue on to that. You spoke about transparency. Thank you. And part of that transparency is, is actually better understanding the process uh, by which we came to the, to the risks that are actually um, uh, prevalent on both taking a vaccine and not taking a vaccine. And I'm just speaking from that, from the perspective of anything, anything that has scientific results coming out of it, just expressing the results in percentages and in numbers and in, in, in validations does not really comfort the public. Better understanding the steps that the scientists took to come to these conclusions, to these recommendations, will provide a better perspective and understanding of, the, you, you sort of humanize the research process rather than just showing the results of it. And that could help significantly in the dialogue of a lot of these different um, controversial or sensational um, topics that are out there today. Okay, thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I'm gonna introduce a, a concept here that I'm gonna call conflicts of obligation. And so when you look at something like a, a vaccine, there's some science that says it works and it's safe, 
but there's some maybe very small but finite element of risk that means in aggregate it looks very good and you might look at that in aggregate and say oh, that sounds fine but the problem is that if you happen to be the one person or your child happens to be the one person that is in the small percentage that don't have a good outcome that's actually a hundred percent for you so the, the reason why this idea of conflict of obligation is important is because um, when people then start to think about and engage with a, a product like a vaccine everybody everybody has an obligation to society, you have to think that through. So if I don't use this vaccine, what does that mean for everybody else around me? So I have an obligation to society, but I also have an obligation to myself. And so then I've got my individual interests. And I think it's really important that that's an idea that um, people really consider and we actually um, bring society into that conversation so they understand that there's this fundamental trade-off oftentimes between your obligations to yourself and your obligations to everybody else, and that you have to think through what that means before you make a decision. Shalisa. Yes, thank you. Um, to piggyback off all the other panelists, um, I think, uh, again, from a research researcher point of view, it is really important to com effectively communicate your results. Um, as the minister was saying, um, you know, look at the whole process of what it took to get to the results, to get to the vaccination, and then communicate that, go into uh, discussions with the community, understand why, if they don't want to take the, med the vaccination, what their, what their fears are, what the, what, why, did, why they um, don't believe in taking in the vaccination. Because one important thing about vaccination is herd, immun uh, herd immunity, which we were talking about. Um, as Mr. Thompson was saying, that um, you have an obligation to the society, your, the society that you live in, because you're not living alone, you're not in your city by yourself. And so if everybody is thinking, oh, I'm not going to take the vaccine, then yeah, we're not going to get the herd immunization, um, meaning you won't be uh, protected, which is, I think, what we are going to talk about now with the outbreak. I was <laughs> going to talk slightly, to take a slightly different uh, approach. Uh, I think uh, vaccination is a very good example of uh, the, the need to have a deeper understanding of how things work. Um, because uh, you see, now people are used to the idea, in particular because of the use of technology, that uh, when you have a tool, then the tool is 100% e efficient. And uh, this view, of course, is completely wrong with, uh, with anything which has to do with life. <coughs> because the fundamental value of living bodies is that they adapt and they know how to, to resist, to, to be resilient. And a very good example of this is the statistics, which the first time you look at it looks very strange, which is that the kids who have been uh, educated in the neighborhood of animals uh, tend to be, of course, more often sick when they are very young, but not severely sick, but later on much better protected. So the belief that if you have a completely clean environment without bacteria or anything, looks like for a kid is just perfect because they don't know not exposed to this. But actually, if they are not exposed, it means their body is not developing the, the capacity to resist. So of course, the, the balance, which is a difficult balance, is that because a minor uh, in, uh, infection is something which is not bad. Of course, it's unpleasant. But in the end, it gains you something. So it shows that if you have a mechanical view that because of science and technology, you avoid everything, so you should clean everything to the end, so it should be just no bacteria at all, you believe it's good, in the end, it's, it's not the right approach because you're talking about living things. So if you don't introduce this idea uh, that really the, the fundamental uh, value of uh, living uh, species is exactly the capacity to adapt and to resist, and which, of course, it goes on with, uh, if you uh, invent antibiotics, it's fantastic to treat a number of uh, illnesses. But then if the illness itself develops its resistance, then you are facing a new phenomenon. So that's why you have also to be very careful in the way you use um, uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is always this. But you have to understand this idea that living bodies are able to adapt. And you are able to adapt, but also illnesses are able yeah. to adapt. So um, I think this is a great example of a topic where public discussion, as you were saying, State Secretary, is really important. And how you actually hold that discussion is a real issue that comes back again and again across the whole topic that we're discussing. So I do want to come back to that, the role of social media, the way in which the, the, the country, the state, can help a debate happen and so on. However, 
here's your chance to influence that discussion. If anyone, I'm sure there must be some people in this audience who would like to say something. There's somebody there, but um, the, the people with the microphone will go to, if you put up your hand, I hope we can hear from at least some of you. Skepticism and sensationalism, and we live in an age where a lot of populism has gotten in the way of believing in or and disbelieving in science. Science is expensive, and this is a major sort of societal problem because science has to be supported by the public in all kinds of ways. And I just that's it. Okay, that's important. I mean, the populism is definitely a source of uh, discussion. Definitely, um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to let the, the fine. Yeah, if you could stand up when you speak, it'll be helpful. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is da David. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, I come from a less developed country, um, and I see some relationships sometimes between. Could you hold the mic closer? Trust in science in lesser developed countries. I think it's maybe we're not as complacent because we see any th uh, the good that we could get from that, and I see less trust on it, which is uh, worrying to more developed country in more developed countries. Do you think there's a reason for that? Thank you. One more question. One more point. Uh, hello, I'm Max, and um, I think I do not know nearly enough about vaccines to say anything good or bad about it. But what I do understand is that if the public does resist against these vaccines, we are basically throwing resources at developing new vaccines and there's no real benefit if no one takes these vaccines. And I think maybe if we do not show so much resistance to almost every decision scientists do in these days and ages, uh, we actually might be able to improve the flaws of these drugs and okay. all these other stuff much faster than if we have to discuss this over and over again. Why is this good? Why is this bad? Right. Please take this. Please don't take this. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, taking those comments into account, because they're all they're definitely relevant to the discussion, um, I'm opening, opening it to any one of you who wants to, to start um, about how this debate in this particular case, uh, can be held within a country, let's talk about it at a national level, um, in a way that makes the dialogue happen, that feeds in all these different perspectives, that allows people to learn about the process. Um, is, it, is there a way in which the interest should be represented by a particular group, as in a consensus conference, for example? Or is it a national referendum? Or wh what is it? Just let's, let's look at different ways forward. So who wants to speak first? I'm happy to respond to some of the, what you've just said and to some of the things in the audience. So uh, I really like the point about populism. I think it's very good. Uh, I think that's the response to these other isms that I described. And then you used a very interesting word. You said beliefs. And that opens up another very important box. Somebody else talked about scientists making decisions. Scientists don't actually make that many decisions. There's, I think, three groups that really shape how society moves forward. Uh, there's politics. There's religion. And there's science. And they often get very confused. And so some people talk about science as if it's a religion. And other people use science for very political purposes. And so then, Philip, when you say, how would you have a debate about this? I think it's actually fairly important for that debate to be amongst those constituencies, but it, for it to be absolutely explicit. Who's the scientist? Who's the religious leader? And who's the politician? Mm -hmm. And then I think it's really important for the people who listen to try and synthesize those different perspectives and boundary conditions to uh, figure out what might be good policy to help society move forward, bearing in mind that when those things happen, what you're doing is to use the coercive power, the forcible power, oftentimes, of the state to make people do things. For example, in some countries, uh, certainly in the United States, if you don't have vaccinations for your children, they can't go to school. And so that's a very big deal if you make that part of law. So let's just, can we pick up on the law bit or the mm -hmm. obligations bit where there is an imperative on parents to vaccinate and whether you have views about that. I think in France there was 
either a successful attempt or it failed to bring in legislation that ob obligated people, and I think in your country too. So let's hear at least those. Yeah, it's true that recently the French government has uh, increased the number of uh, obligatory vaccinations if you go to school, uh, but it, in a very strange way. So if a school is a public school or a so-called uh, school which is affiliated with the state, which uh, receives support from the state, even if it's a private school, then uh, of course you're subject to that. But then some schools are completely outside and then uh, the, the obligation of being vaccinated to get to school drops. And some people even saw this as a, uh, some kind of a way of um, actually escaping from the obligation and then uh, an incentive to develop these uh, schools which are completely out of control of the state, uh, which of course shows that there is some kind of a doubt about the how the state is dealing with these issues. So, uh, but still, I mean, uh, I the reference was made to the fact that my my daughter is, um, is a medical doctor and uh, she, she has been exposed to this uh, fact that uh, being non-vaccinated introduces real risk even of uh, uh, illnesses which are very often considered minor for, for kids but they can still kill. And, and therefore, you, you, I mean, as a medical doctor, she's really uh, militant for, for people to get understand why it's so fundamental to, to be vaccinated. So there's this balance which is a complicated one when really the resistance starts to build, uh, build up. Of course, the key element is to get the discussion on the, tru on the truth. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, of course, there have been some uh, incidents, but if you compare the incidents to the benefits, that is people who have, who have been saved because of the presence of the law and the obligation, yeah. this is the balance to be done. And then you are exactly in discussion yeah. that Andrew brought, uh, brought forward, namely of the conflict of obligations, yeah. which yeah. is a very serious issue, which uh, cannot be ignored in society. So, Minister, would you like to talk about your country? In the case of the Emirates, whether you're in the private school or public schools, you need to have a certified immunization card to register um, your child into school. Uh, something else that has been rolled out is the boosters that need to be given at certain ages are given at the schools, and the parents have to actually sign a declaration that they're going against immunizing their child, and it does have a bit of information about the impact that it has on society. Um, as a whole, um, and it's an opt-out sort of um, uh, um, obligation that schools have for the boosters that need to happen at certain ages. Um, so that does have a, an impact when it comes to immunization on a national level. So you have a very, let's call it a top-down approach to coercion, if you like, um, or insistence that uh, citizens do um, serve the wider interests of the community. But in the meantime, a lot of the campaigns around the world have been enormously, against vaccination, have been enormously powerful on social media. And so the question is, is that it, it, how, one, how does one try to counter that, whether you are in a government or you're a citizen or a researcher, Lisa? Um, are there things that people should do as scientists, for example, in the social media to be more active in getting the message out? And can countries do more at the national level to counter this from the bottom-up point of view rather than just an, a coercion? So, I'm gonna, Shalisa, maybe you've got some comments about that and then I'll – anyone yeah. else? Yes. Um, so, uh, when I was in school, uh, so social media wasn't that hot. I mean, that's been 10 years ago. Um, and um, so, we were only taught as researchers, as scientists, um, what the truth was. So, the truth nowadays is more complex because – when I was studying, it was about being honest, no fraud, and having honest publications. Whereas now, you also have social media that's involved, and we have not been trained into using social media as a tool as researchers. So um, to, uh, com to compete with you know, the anti-fax mo movement, our sensational news, um, it's really important, I think, uh, to, um, to train scientists also and to have scientific communication um, as part of uh, the curriculum uh, in, uh, in schools, um, but also that the government, um, the Ministry of Health in, the different, in different countries, um, talk about dissemination of uh, scientific evidence. Um, and as scientists, we also have the obligation to nuance the news because um, you know, these kind of forests also give us the opportunity to discuss these, um, you know, the sensational news. And um, for instance, in my country, it's the same as in the UAE. 
you have to get vaccinated in order to get to school and it's a national program and then also it's an opt-out when you're in a primary school um, and um, I don't, in my country, it's not, um, vaccination is not a problem in the sense that people don't want to get it. It's more of sometimes it's not available. So people really want to get it instead of, you know, yeah, being yeah. against it. Right, right. Does anyone else want to comment about the social media aspects and what can be done? Yes, please. I think we have to use the media which is used by the society. And if the young generation nowadays uses strongly social media, we have also to use this media to get into interaction. Yes. And of course, it's, it's difficult for the older part of uh, the population, also me, yes. uh, to use this, but, but then we have to, to help, to support that uh, the scientists, uh, um, yep. the, maybe the government, the administration, the, the doctors, can use this to, to get into interaction. And I think another topic which was mentioned before, schools. Uh, education is very important. And when I visited school, we didn't have social media. We had books and um, yeah. yes, uh, information which was uh, well um, prepared and uh, reliable. Nowadays, we have a lot of different uh, possibilities to get information. And I think it's an important uh, task for our schools to teach the children what kind of information is reliable mm -hmm. and there is also some work behind and what is just belief maybe in a very emotional, interesting way, mm -hmm. but not with really facts behind. Okay. I'm tempted to ask who remembers books, but I won't. <laughs> I won't do that. I won't do that. Did you want to comment on yeah. So th we've realized very early on that communication on social media is much more impactful than anywhere else. And more importantly, because I'm not sure if this is exists prevalent anywhere else, the forwarding on messaging apps, we use, we, I receive on a daily basis, and people receive and exchange a lot of information that is a lot of misinformation. And the volume of it and the, the people that actually believe it are people that you'll usually think that they would think twice prior to believing this piece of information. Um, and because of that, uh, we've established within my office a team that's dedicated at, at creating content um, for the public from science. And that relieves and alleviates the burden from the scientists. So what we request from scientists is whenever you have information, whenever you say anything, just, just it, it's as simple as drop us an email with all of the information. And there's a team sitting sitting there that is translating a lot of that into something that is understandable, right. transforming it into <coughs> story, transforming it into a video. Some we put on our normal channels, some we also dissipate through forwarding and so on. People don't usually know the source of mm -hmm. it. Um, and something else that we've worked on is establishing a youth science council. So there are a group of young professionals or graduate students or people that are just entering the field or graduating from the sciences. and. One of the primary things that they've brought up is, is, and it's a program that's still in development by them, is something called myth versus fact. And they do take a lot of those sensational things that we receive um, by messages and transform them into, and provide the scientific reasoning on why, or not, why not it's correct. And through these indirect means, you start um, giving the public tools off. So when you do receive this information, question where did it come from? Um, and what is the source of it? Who is that scientist? Because to, mm -hmm. pu pu to make anything credible, people will go like a scientist set and then a blurb of information there. Is this a prompt response? Because these myths can grow very rapidly. Yes, it grows pretty rapidly. You see it, it exchanged <coughs> in various close circles between people. And I'm telling you, it's not, it's not people that are not educated that are talking about these. Mm. It is highly educated people in society that are yeah, talking yeah. about these. And maybe yeah. the root cause of this is what you just spoke about, is that we were used to getting information from books, from valid sources, from journals, from articles, um, and they were all valid, versus now having a wealth of information at our fingertips and a wealth of information that anyone could put out there. So anybody can publish something online. This is something that we need to all think about when we're consuming things online. Just, just. I'm not saying that it's credible or not. What I'm saying is you, you need to do the due diligence now to check if it's credible or not. 
versus before when we had somebody else doing the work for us. Yeah. So, so um, I don't want to spend the whole session about the vaccine, but, there but there's a generic point in what you were saying. Um, there was a study done some time ago about the cognitive maps behind messages used by people. And they looked in the vaccine case, MMR, at the messages sent by CDC and the messages sent by the anti-vaccination lobbyists. And they showed that the cognitive maps of the lobbyists were much richer mm -hmm. in the way they intersected with people's emotions and people's perceptions of risk. And the CDC were doing a good job, but only in a sort of little corner. Is there a danger in what you're saying that your approach misses that richness? So the... Um, in the perspective of the richness, we're talking about the emotional aspect yes. of it, yeah. and that's what you're what you're trying to do when you're when you're linking it to storytelling. Yeah. It's the it's the emotional aspect that you plug into it. It's the personal story that you plug into right. it, and that's what it that's what it's meant to be doing. Yeah. Um, so not only does it so the correct balance is not only focusing on the emotional aspect; it's focusing on both together. What we're currently doing is just providing the facts. Yeah. Yeah. But if you provide the facts coupled with the emotional aspect. Yeah. and actually acknowledge what they hear and what moved them emotionally and right, address that. Right, right. That does provide a bit, of a, a bit of understanding. You sort of open the door for discussion. Okay. Um, I am going to move on now to a, a slightly broader topic, still in the health sphere, and that's digital health. But it relates to the bigger problems of big data, the bigger opportunities of big data. Um, so a positive example of digital health um, for example, could be if you're looking at a, at a country that has access to phones, not necessarily smartphones, you can, for example, help pregnant mothers take good care of themselves, Im improve the way in which they look after themselves through remote telemedicine, if you like, or t telepublic health. We had an example from Andrew of particular technology where there are data that uh, there may have been a sensational headline, but it was tapping into a public nerve about the risks and the lack of privacy that can happen, the leaking of information, etc. So there has to be some attention to that, as, as you will understand as better than anyone, probably. So the ethics in digital health and the, the concerns that there are in the public about that, I do think are worth touching on. And I know some of you have actually been involved in discussions about that. So um, shall I start with you? State okay. Secretary, because I know that you've been involved in thinking about that. <coughs> I think in, I think concerning all these questions, it's uh, very important to involve humanities and social science in discussion. Right now, we talked a lot about uh, engineering, natural sciences, and uh, in the context of digitalization, um, it's really important uh, to not only um, use the bridge between science and society, also to use the bridge between the different domains of science. And yes, of course, I think these are important questions which we have to address. We have an enormous uh, potential of digital health, uh, personalized health, uh, really to, to help uh, the people, but we also have topics like um, who has access to the data, is the data personalized or, or not, and um, what do we do with this data, and uh, of course we can have uh, ideas what is the right way to deal with this, but uh, then we have questions like uh, cybersecurity, so even if we have a good uh, setup, how we want to deal it, maybe somebody is going uh, to yeah. take our data yeah. and is doing something with it. And I think we should involve strongly social sciences and humanities mm -hmm. in this discussion. Okay, so uh, if you say that, I'm going to go to Jean-Pierre, who is the president of um, a fantastic gem of Europe, which is the R European Research Council. And one of its great strengths is that it has great representation of all the disciplines across it. You have done multidisciplinary funding as well as uh, individual disciplinary funding, and you've been involved in the discussions at a European level about some of these issues. So I wonder if you can talk about the research dimension of how humanities, social sciences, and the other, the natural sciences, come together at the research level in thinking about this issue. Well, actually, 
well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to say something about this issue, which uh, very often, as you said, I mean, in, the, in English, science tends to exclude social science humanities, and even some countries at the moment are considering that it's uh, against the, 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 the it's against the, the, the country itself to develop uh, social sciences and humanities, which of course is uh, very bad news for, for the future of uh, mankind. But uh, yeah, at the level of European Research Council, we, we do cover all fields. And uh, last year, I think we spent uh, 480 million euros supporting social science humanities. So it makes it the largest uh, program to support social science humanities in the world. And uh, so a very good example of this is the, the fact to tackle s a number of issues, actually, you cannot separate the social dimension from uh, and the no knowledge about the social impact of what you do from the research itself. And uh, so this is uh, something which uh, is not uh, obvious because sometimes uh, the, the structure of the uh, system, uh, research system in the, in the universities, in the countries, tend to really uh, have people working in silos. And so to break these silos is something which is not easy at all. Because in particular, you, uh, you mentioned also the question of careers and incentives you <coughs> was, was mentioned. Um, for the moment, for scientists to really be recognized, it's uh, certainly, uh, it looks like a better strategy to really be as narrow-minded as possible mm -hmm. because you, b you become the expert on the one topic when actually it's very clear today that most of the major advances came out of completely new approaches, which means often bringing, bridging the gap between disciplines or bringing a, a new vision on, uh, on some things. And this is why we have developed uh, what we call synergy program with the idea that people can uh, propose very ambitious goals scientifically uh, and they can come up with all kinds of combinations of uh, knowledge, of uh, expertise, uh, of skills that they feel appropriate mm -hmm. to tackle this. And uh, for, of course, uh, the question which comes immediately to this, because any time you speak about science and supporting science, how do you evaluate science? And of course, to create uh, the proper environment to evaluate science is a delicate one, which uh, at the European, science, European Research Council level, we are facing all the time. We know if we don't have a high quality evaluation, then the program will just go down. So convincing the best scientists to engage in this evaluation in particular to engage in uh, evaluation with scientists not of their discipline right. uh, is, is difficult. Uh, okay. Yesterday night I tackled the question of getting our experts for 2020 for this uh, synergy program and our um, success rate in convincing people to come to the panels is much lower than for others. Very often with the argument, yes, but you see, I'm not a pluridisciplinary researcher. Okay. But that's not the issue. The issue is to be open to be willing to discuss with others, to understand their values, how they uh, measure things, and to confront it with your own uh, traditional approach. Right. So this is for research um, funders extremely important yep. Yep. to set up right mechanisms, right. but also for the scientists, the communities to understand, of course, there is value in expertise in a narrow way, yep. but this is fundamental that they open up. Right. So I will come back to the panel in a minute to, to keep talking about digital health because I think it is an important topic. But it, embedded in it are topics about data um, and AI and so on. And I'm sure there are people in the audience who might have questions or comments to make, brief comments to make about some of those topics, bearing in mind that this is about bridging the gap between the research community and the public. So with that in mind, I'll come back to the audience in a, in a minute to make some comments. But um, I'm gonna, maybe I'll talk to you, Shalisa, next. I mean, do you want to say more about how you see digital health from your perspective as a researcher? Yes, so um, I see it as a tool, a useful tool in order to get more data. Uh, for instance, also in my study, I use a, a heart failure mobile app studying, so we can monitor uh, patients from a distance. Um, and I think um, going back, uh, you know, to the to the start, I, one of the things that drives laws, making laws, is innovation and new things. So now that we are into digital health and into using these kind of tools, um, you know, the laws will come and the ethical guidelines because we don't have in my country we don't have ethical guidelines on using digital, mm -hmm. uh, on data, and so these, in the, we are in the process right now of using of e-governance and um, and such things. 
So um, the use of digital health in my country is based on our morals and our values. Um, of I, I have the I have the blessing to be working with um, uh, the Netherlands, so I am g I am you know obligated to their laws, uh, which makes my study more validated, and I can also publish internationally. Um, but the things that I have been seeing in my study, for instance, are that um, because I'm doing it in an older population, mm -hmm. heart failures in 60 plus people. Um, the acceptance of using these kind of tools is not as easy as when you know we were going to do it in yep. uh, you know teens who are now tech savvy and they're just using their phones for everything. So I see it as an important tool, as a promising tool, but we also have to educate the people, the patients, or you know society in the the use and the benefits of these kind of tools, yeah. um, because I can understand that. Um, there are some risks into data, um, you know, data privacy, mm -hmm. um, and you know, who, who's, what, what are you going to do with my data? Yeah. Um, you know, so that those are the questions that I get from my patients, yeah. and then I have to answer them and be, you know, I'm like, no, it's all de de identified. Nobody's going to see it, um, but it's still, it's still, they're still cautious. So, in just just to pick up on that. Um, there's been a lot of work around the world on thinking about those privacy issues, uh, yeah. especially in the health context. Yes. Do you feel you have access to that? Do you feel you can learn from that and have more confidence in what you say? Or do you feel actually it's very patchy and it's isolated? Um, um, health technology? Yeah, in, t in terms of the, the assurance you can get or the, the process you can use in mm -hmm. terms of getting people's consent. Um, so I think it depends on a country, as one of the um, audience members was saying, uh, you have a difference between developing countries and developed yeah. countries, the Western yeah. world. Um, so in, in my country, we, are, we have a very young techni uh, technical uh, community um, uh, of our digital. We are not really into the third industrial revolution. We're yeah. going into the fourth right now. So um, I have uh, using such an app in my study is, you know, is far advanced for a lot of people in, in yep. Suriname. Um, but I can, I can show them how easy it is to get data because one of the things that we want to do with, um, with using this app is find algorithms because at, after a, a few years, we will have so much data that we can easily find patient profiles and treat people right. effectively and better. Right. So um, I just had evaluation on the pilot project and one of the things that came out is, you know, get more workshops with the people that are using these kind of apps mm -hmm. and how to get them involved. Because one of the things is that, um, you know, the app can be developed from um, a professional kind of view, but will these people understand it? Will they, will they really use it? What's the adherence of them using it? Right. Um, and that is one of the challenges, challenges that we are facing right okay. now. Okay. Um, and that, that also is, tied to you know the their cautiousness of what okay. are you going to do with my data okay. so i'm going to come back to the other two panel members who i haven't asked about this in a minute but this is your chance if any of you want to make a comment uh, put your hands up somebody has a mic already there you go okay hello thank you for the wonderful discussion first of all um i'm i'm a researcher myself so i understand the value that digitalization has in terms of access to data, you know, to push forward the research, and of course in public health to better and to optimize, et cetera. But in an age where I personally feel like my data is all over the place and a lot of companies have access to this data, my question when we, in the public health sector, is where do we actually draw the line and who gets to make that decision? Okay, that's a key question. I think yeah. there's Another one done. Okay, there are two more here, and I'll take these two, if we, if we may, please. And then we'll get to the panel answers. Just behind you. Uh, my name is Alec. My name is Alec Gagne. I was born here in Switzerland, a developing country. And we've had all sorts of forum discussions about clean water, plastic waste. We've talked about the fact that... Uh, that biodiversity is declining, flora and fauna species are dying out, 150 species every year disappear. 
And now we're talking about uh, vaccination or immunization programs, and we've been told that there are countries in which a child won't be accepted at school if it's not vaccinated. What sort of democratic decision-making process is that? Okay, you say you can discuss this as long as you like, but it amounts to vaccinating your child with heavy metals, and no one here on the panel has spoken out against the poisoning of all these children. Should we not, a civil society, stand up and say, how come we don't get to choose freely ourselves whether we want to vaccinate our children or not? How come all we have on the panel here are people who are in favor of immunization, who think it's a good thing that people should be forced to vaccinate their children? Wait, I haven't finished yet, and I've taken up far less time than the panelists. I would really like to urge all of you here to be more critical. The World Economic Forum here talks about nature, natural topics. Uh, this is the open forum, but in the closed forum where we don't have access, that's where they're talking about where they're going to organize the next war in Iran, for example. That's not a joke. The Pentagon has got 27,000 PR managers who are there to sell us war. We've got to wake up now. We've got to wake up and come to terms with the fact that this is a propaganda exercise so that simply so that Davos can keep hold on to the forum as long as possible. I think that in an open forum, it should be possible also to hear a critical voice. Thank you very much for your understanding. So a, a key point that came in that was a particular assertion about metal poisoning in vaccinations. There has been discussion about that. I do want to respond to that at some, I mean, I would like somebody, if they can, to respond to how that risk is being assessed. But there was one other person who had a comment. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Renata. I'm representing a think tank, uh, the Geneva Macro Labs that we just founded with some friends, and it's fantastic food for thought. So thank you very much. I really like the aspect of um, having a look at where the data comes from, whether is the um, getting the facts right when it comes from social media, is it credible information, and also the communication between science and civil society. So this is um, really, I really uh, like that aspect. Um, there was a question about the security, about um, data um, when it comes to digital health. Um, what does my uh, word, um, is it credible when I, when I have a digital device in e-health, uh, where do my data go through? And um, I have a question, maybe Mr. Thompson can uh, answer it. In terms of blockchain, um, can that be an answer to, to that problem? Because blockchain ensures that data somehow is more, let's say, confidential and not accessible to everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So on the question of data and reliability, Andrew first and then the minister. I'd be interested to get your view as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of very rich um, themes and concept here, but let, let's just maybe go to this point about blockchain and, and, and security. Um, something that's really important to understand is that the number one issue with respect to health data is the security of that data. And when I say security, I don't mean whether somebody knows what your blood pressure is or your blood type. I mean whether they can change it. Because if I can change your blood type, I can kill you. So security in the digital age is the number one issue, not privacy, right? If you, if you can change a blood type, you take a person, you change a bank account, you can wreck a country, you change a, an electric grid, I mean, you can, you can do massive things. So security is the number one issue. And there's a lot of talk, of course, about how blockchain and the distributed internet can potentially add a lot to the security aspects of how we protect ourselves. It's a very, very important macro issue for all countries, all governments, all people. So security is number one. By the way, people always use this cyber word, and actually that's a bit of a mistake because the number one way in which most um, digital or electronic systems are accessed is physically. And the biggest mistake that most people make is not to physically secure buildings and make it not possible for third parties to, for example, plug a dongle into your computer, right? So security number one. Privacy. Uh, in my view, this is a word that's taken on a life of its own and actually is the wrong word completely. The whole point about the global internet is that it's made for sharing. 
That's what it does. That's why it's so powerful. People share posts, they share pictures, they share messages. It's for sharing. It's not for keeping things private. The real question around this sharing idea is how does it work? And somebody made a, a question about where do you draw the line and how does that work? There's something called consented sharing, which most people are happy to do. I'm going to share with my friends. I'm going to let my friends share. So you consent to things. That's well understood. There's something called criminal sharing, and everyone hates that, and, but that's well understood. And then there's something called coercive sharing, which is the government might force you to, to, to give you information or the police might come and look at your phone. There's a much more important concept that's not well understood and that needs to be talked about much, much more uh, clearly, and that's what I'm going to call clandestine sharing. And that means you sign up for a product or a service or you use the internet, and then the company that you think you're um, finding out whether you're from Sweden from because you're doing a DNA test is actually using that information and selling it to police forces to find out if you're a rapist. Maybe you wouldn't pay them if that was what you thought they were going to do with your data. And that's what I call clandestine sharing. Um, and it's very common and it's something that really needs to be in the dialogue because those are lines that need to be drawn. And in my view, the people who need to draw the lines are the consumers who should be able to curate their own data. It's very, very important. Do you, uh, I just before I come to the minister, uh, do you feel the tech companies can do more to behave better and to prevent clandestine sharing? So I think one of the things that's quite important is that we've got into a position where we're discovering things that I think perhaps are um, surprising and maybe not as ethical as we would like, but we're in a very, very new domain. And uh, my fellow panelist here mentioned this point about the ethics of the digital age. This is a crucial topic that absolutely needs to start to be discussed and, and fleshed out. And I think we should be very careful about being judgmental because it's all very new. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very, very important that we start to actually in, in engage on those topics and actually figure out what should happen. One last point. Somebody here mentioned, and, and, and this is very common in, in, in medical researchers, this idea of anonymity. Oh, you can just strip data and an anonymize it. Uh, I spend an enormous amount of time working with some of the world's leading tech companies, Amazon, Tencent, Apple, these are all companies that we work with very deeply, and I can assure you that it doesn't matter how you strip information off health records, you can be re-identified in seconds. Okay, hope that reassures everybody. Okay. <laughs> Minister, in the light of that upbeat comment. That, that, that is very reassuring, <laughs> say, thank you. Say, no, it's a, it's a, it's it's a factor. It's really important to know it. No, you're quite right. The tech companies know this, and you're healthcare right. people don't. No, you're quite right. So let's come back to that, actually, but yes, please. Yeah. So this is an ongoing debate yep. today across several countries and also at international forums such as the World Economic Forum. So yep. I'll speak to both. Um, I sit on the Global Future Councils on Biotechnology and what they're addressing for this year is actually data privacy from a personal perspective and more importantly putting together the right framework that would protect individuals. Um, from national perspective, this is something that is coming into play. So before when we spoke about health ethics and ethics in healthcare, it was more geared towards research and studies that are happening within small communities and not something that is engaging the wider public. So the current health, health ethics mechanisms or policies or procedures or regulations that currently exist within countries don't address, um, don't address wearables or technology, collecting your data and storing them and so on. But this is something that is on the agenda. I know this is the on the agenda in my country. We are putting, we are getting the perspective of the users, the community, getting the perspective of people that are in healthcare and in research, and making sure that one, the data is stored in the correct manner, it is distributed to the right people, and it is not used to harm um, individuals. And more importantly, People need to know what kind of data they're giving and how it's going to be utilized. So it's the information part that is highly um, that is that is highly relevant to each individual to do, myself included. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that this is an ongoing debate and an ongoing discussion. So each person can play a, p a part in shaping those policies and shaping those regulations in their own countries. Um, but you heard what Andrew said. <laughs> So, um, and I think it's true, <laughs> just yeah. if for what it's worth, because I've, I've, I've met other people who've really thought about, you know, how difficult it is to strip data. Um, there comes a point where the population realizes that they're a part of an ecosystem where this is the new reality. Um, it's rather like in Britain, we have CCTV cameras everywhere, 
and people have come to accept it because they see the benefits of it, even though their privacy is at the same time lost. Can I also bring the example Please. of Google? So yes. How many people here use Google? Do you know how much information Google correct yeah. collects from just you typing in your search items? But you all accept it. So yeah. it's, it's, that, it's sort of that trade-off of what am I, this is something that's coming. What are you willing to accept and what are you not willing to accept? That's where the dialogue is there. So Andrew, when that, yes, I'll come to you. So Andrew, when that sensationalism happened that you referred to that affected your own mm -hmm. company, um, Nevertheless, it was tapping into something. How, how would you like, if you had access to everybody through a social media, which you did actually in principle, how would, what, what would be your response to that? To just don't believe the headlines, it's nonsense, or there is a real thing here and here's my answer? Well, so, um, look, I, I think when you start any kind of conversation from a sensational or extreme point of view, it's actually very difficult to have a sensible conversation because if I start off, you know, 100 miles over that way, you typically start off 100 miles in the other direction. And so that doesn't lead to reasoned uh, and reassuring debate. And so, actually, I prefer not to respond to any kind of silly, sensational headline because I don't think that's a good place to start a conversation. Right. Uh, I do think it's really important for consumers to know and understand that you mentioned Google. Um, people think, for example, that Google and Facebook offer free services. They don't they've created a new currency. It's called your data, and that's what you pay for those services with. And we're just beginning to understand that the data that we pay with is incredibly valuable and has led to the creation of trillion dollar companies because they're monetizing you. Now, that may or may not be a good thing, but it's really, really important that people understand that and they understand the differences between the business models that different companies prosecute. And so the most important question that any consumer can ask when they're making use of any digital product or service is how does this company make money? Not what do they do for me, but what is their business model and how do they actually end up with dollars in the bank? Because that will tell you everything you need to know about whether and why you would share information with that company. So how would you make that visible as a science communicator? As, as a, as a science communicator, so that's absolutely true and it's a difficult thing for somebody yeah. to do. Um, you need somebody who's going to be independent of those companies to be able to portray that, but they're not going to be open necessarily about that. So how do we get that landscape, that web, if you like, of information yeah. trading so, um, visible? Uh, I think it's going to take some time, and indeed I think it should take some time, for these kinds of organizations, uh, markets, spaces, places, to be regulated, because they're all very new, and if you move too quickly into hard and fast rules, um, in my view, you'll, you'll really lose a lot of potential benefit for, for society. It's really, really important for the people who participate in these kinds of markets, in these kinds of products, in these kinds of services, to start to have that dialogue themselves. And I'll just do a plug here. I, I work very closely with Stanford University. Stanford has just launched a series of seminars on ethics in the digital age. And in the first series of seminars on that, what came out actually here is that there's a heavy emphasis on um, uh, working with consumers and essentially um, consumer consent, disclosure and telling consumers in 27 pages of stuff that they can't read, this is what you're consenting to uh, when you use our product. What we concluded actually out, out of these first seminars is that it's really important to move away from consumer consent to a concept of corporate obligation. That if you are a company and you are working with these kinds of data sets, you have an absolute duty of care and an obligation to make sure that you do nothing that would be unethical or unexpected or could harm the consumer. Yeah. And that's a really important concept, and it's a shift from saying, oh, if you just tell people, it'll be okay. Right. So, Shalisa, I'll come back to you in a minute. I just want to say to the audience, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, after Shalisa said what she wants to say, I'll come back to you. If there are any comments you want to make about the topic that we, you think needs to be said, for one minute maximum, um, we, I'm, I'll have time for one or two of those and then we'll finish with perhaps some final comments from the panel about perhaps having heard this conversation, one thing they might think they will do that they were already thinking of doing or that they will now think about doing um, going forward. And again, they will have very little time to do that. Anyway, Shalisa, please, anything you want to say. 
Yes, so actually I was going to say what Mr. Thompson was saying, that data is currency. And we've been seeing that a lot of companies like Google and um, Facebook have been using that model for a number of years. However, when we're talking about our public health, um, that becomes a little bit tricky because how are you going to how are you going to make money off of my data? So I think that's where um, you know ethical guidelines are more um, strict, need to be more strict, because um, you know we're not talking about marketing. You know, I oh I googled, for instance, going to a vacation for another country, and then I will get a number of ads on that. This is my data about my health, yeah. and so. Companies are right now using that data in order to make products, uh, manufacture products, and sell that. So I just want to make sure that we, we all understand that data is currency, and uh, we can use it for good, but of course we also know that it yeah. will be used for bad. So. Right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Who else wants to say something? Put up your hand and the microphone will come your way. There's somebody back there. Hello? Over there? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Hello. So I have... A question about climate change. Mm. How can science communicate that? <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that one. And there was a question up there. Sorry. Hi, everyone. My name's Eric. And I would like to come back to the social media issue you've talked about. And in my opinion, <coughs> a big challenge is just to um, overcome this uh, packaging of information into like two or three minutes maximum, of just uh, consuming this information. And I think the difficulty with that is that science needs more time to be uh, explained. And if the youth just consumes every information in like little packages, uh, you need to find a way to tackle this and also um, tackle the issue that social media is just our prime source, source of information right. at the moment in this age. Right. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll come on to brevity in the social media. I, I will t take the question of climate change, if you don't mind, because we're, we're, we're getting on time. Um, I've been talking to climate change researchers quite a lot recently. Of course, out there on the web, freely available, there's tons of information digested from the science in the form of panel discussions by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, etc. So the science is out there. It is not necessarily very digestible. And the community, I think, feels right now a need, A, to focus on the impacts of climate change rather than so much just the research of what is happening and to communicate that. So I do think there's a potentially a move within the community to, to move in that direction a little bit, also in their research, actually, and also to engage. There are a lot of climate scientists who have felt that it, it's just not their job to engage, even though there are all the controversies, and part, partly because of the controversies. They're very concerned about this boundary between advocacy and science. Mm -hmm. And I think every researcher has to respect that boundary and to try and be clear whether you're an advocate for something or a researcher trying to assess the facts. Even that's a very difficult thing. So I think the point about your, your question is a very important one, that somehow or another the research community still has a job to do in that communication. I don't know whether anyone on the panel, we won't go around the whole panel, but anyone wants to comment about brevity and the problems today, whether you call it attention span or you call it something intrinsic to the social media forum about brevity. So Andrew has something to say. I just I think it's very important to understand that Social media is a manifestation of a, a new technological capability. We've moved from mass markets to markets of me. And so you've got very precise and individualistic communication. It has big implications actually for science because we're actually in an era now where people have an expectation that things work perfectly for me because we're all being fairly precisely phenotyped when we go shopping, when we go use Amazon, we have a very individualized experience. And it's setting expectations that we're moving away from a world that was about probability and statistics into a world that's much more experienced as calculus and certainty. And that cascades back into the discussion about vaccines and science and the, the, the tools that we use, because many of the tools that we use mathematically today are 19th and 20th century tools, and we've actually now got a whole new tool set that has fundamental implications for scientific discovery and for how science actually affects individuals as opposed to societies. Right. Um, I'll, I'll make a comment because I come from the world of communication uh, about the brevity of social media and, and the problem. So just occasionally, 
busy people find themselves hooked into an article that's quite long because it's presented in a way that hooks them. And it may be a particular tag about the narrative of the story that is a human interest story, even though the subject is a technical one, or it can be something that's just fascinating in itself. So a really good writer, a really c c communicator, can actually get more attention than is possible in a, in a tweet, for example. So this is not a good answer, this is not a complete answer to your question, it's a very important question. But in the end, communication is a skill, and you need, I think, to take opportunity where you can to use good communicators. This is not me looking for a job, I promise you, but actually to find good communicators who can hook people into more depth of a treatment. And you can tweet it then, you know, because then it will get tweeted, because people will start saying, hey, I read this and it was great. So I, I do think there is hope there, even though you do have a challenge. Right, so we have very few minutes left, so each person has only about 15 seconds <laughs> to just say what you're going to do, maybe because you're already planning to do it, or that because of this discussion. And um, why don't we go in reverse order this time? So, Jean-Pierre, sorry to put you on the spot first, but uh, you first. Okay, no, I thought I had a few more seconds to think. Um, well, two points, if you allow me, in the very, very briefly. The one on brevity, for me, uh, has to be put in line with also the volume of information which is available. So uh, since uh, a given person can absorb a certain quantity, <laughs> then, of course, <laughs> the result of being under the deluge of information is that, of course, it's packed into very something small. And as a scientist, I know it's a disaster because you, you cannot communicate something with a nuance and uh, in-depth if you don't have some time. One word on uh, climate change, because that's a typical example where the scientific community, first of all, did organize itself at the uh, international level in quite a good way of course, uh, which was a huge effort over many years. But the key point is that that's also one domain in which what has been requested from the scientific community is to prov provide scenarios, which is something which is yeah. very difficult for people to understand yeah. because the scenarios look like, but what is the true one? Yeah. But with the data we have at this moment, it's very, very difficult to, yeah. to, to decide. And on top of that, you hope that people will accept to take measures yeah. which will influence the scenarios which in the end uh, happens. Yeah. So that's the whole battle where you need uh, scientific content to finally uh, get uh, people to act in a proper yeah. way because yeah. then you can avoid things which are clearly catastrophic. Thank you. Okay, Shalisa? Yes, so as a researcher, I will, um, I, I've uh, said this a few times already, um, I think uh, effective communication is needed <coughs> in layman language, but also between different uh, scientific sectors in, um, yeah, so the medical, but also societal. Um, so that is something that I'm taking away. And also the fact that, um, you know, social media will play a huge role. So how do we um, mm. emphasize that or use that, implement that in our research? Right taking into account human psychology when, um, you know, communicating yeah. our results. But thank you. Andrew? Yeah, so I, I think I might advocate for community representation in peer review of papers that get published in scientific journals for mm -hmm. two reasons. One, I think that common sense is often vastly underrated, and I think that in, in, in especially uh, uh, common sense can be used to make complex issues much more understandable to broader audiences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Minister? Um, from my perspective, it would be including society when it comes to discussions on science, especially when we're talking from the realm of, uh, of policies and having them more inclusive of society's perspective. And two, a better bridge between science, technology, and society, especially if it's something that percolates down to schools so that the link of anything that they're learning and studying is actually translated right. into what's, what everyday life. Thank you very much. State Secretary. Increasing... Uh, the exchange between different uh, disciplines of science and between science and society mm -hmm. and on an international level. Yeah. So I think the two things I'm going to draw out of all of that are first the dialogue, and I'm by dialogue I mean dialogue, so it really is a two-way process, mm -hmm. whether it's in the actual conception of a research project or it's in the grand level of thinking about public health and so on, that's one thing. And I think also alongside information, emotion or values need to be seen as a part of the, the arena and dealing with them from whichever perspective you're coming from is really important. And I think scenarios are a part of that actually, the narrative and the, and the potential ways in which things can go 
um, can really bring to life uh, some of these challenges. Okay, so we've had, thank you very much for your contributions and thank you above all to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.